14 years earlier, before I wanted to be a filmmaker for real, I wanted to be an FBI agent. And I used to go on the FBI's most wanted website. I looked at the fugitives and I found them fascinating, you know, and you had a sea of menacing faces like Osama bin Laden, Whitey Bulger, and Jason Derrick Brown just stood out, you know, because here was a surfer dude with spiky hair, green eyes. He just didn't really fit the bill. And when he tells his little buddy, all you got to do is shoot the guy first. Why does someone have to get shot at all? Yeah, you know, it's one of those crazy unsolved mysteries. You know, so much about this story and this case from like his disappearance, you know, to his dad's disappearance. You know, there's just so many questions where I think we're never going to get answers to. But the one scene of violence that you're talking about or the main scene of violence is disturbing, not because of how much violence there is in it, but because of the nature of it, that this murder happened in broad daylight, you know, at a place where people literally go to shop and watch movies and have, you know, a mall. This is Matt Cox, and I'm doing an interview with Matt Gentel. He is a he is a director, screenwriter of a, a true crime film called American Murder. It's about a con man who ends up committing a really a very a very senseless murder. But anyway, we'll get into it. Super interesting. Um, Jess and I watched it a couple of days ago. It was like we were just riveted by by the entire film and I'm I, like I tear films uh, apart and it was it was great it was great so check out the interview we watched the movie together oh um, cool yeah so it was good yeah it was really good like surprisingly amazingly good yeah. especially since we pick apart everything yeah now you know because I I guess because I've I've done writing so you know so much writing and I've optioned some stuff um, I'm actually writing an article for Rolling Stone magazine right now. And I, you know, I'm working with a couple of production companies on some documentaries for some of the stories I've written. So it's like, I, I pick apart everything. Yeah. You know, and when I understand, you know, when I, I got the, I realized like, I don't know, it's just, I was, I was just the whole time. Like, I'm like, I, I like, like they barely, there weren't a lot of actors. There weren't this, he, you know, I, it was it was really interesting. I was like, this is not, this looks like this, a really big budget film. Yeah, and, and it wasn't. <laughs> you're right. But, but yet the actors, like, I'm like, oh, I recognize that guy. I recognize that guy. And obviously, you know, the, the lead was, um, what was his name again? The Tom Pelfrey. Okay. Um, yeah. And for, he was he was in, most famous from Ozark. For um, what? Ozark. Ozark. Oh, see, I remember yeah. him from. Um, wasn't he the killer in uh, Lincoln Lawyer? No, no, that's. Ah, uh, sorry, the other lead, Ryan Philippe. Yeah, yeah, Ryan Philippe. Ryan. Okay. Yeah, I I'm thought you were talking. I thought you were talking about Tom, who plays. Uh, oh no, Jason. he was. He was the guy in Ozarks, the 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 crazy brother. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, yes, Ryan. Reckon. Ryan was the is the killer in Lincoln Lawyer. Yeah, and he plays. The FBI agent. Yeah, that's right. Like the con man guy, I kept looking at him thinking just I and I felt like ah, I've seen him before. I just couldn't place it place where. So you just said Ozark. Yeah. Yeah, no, um, it's it, it was crazy. On day like three of filming, Ryan Philippe is one of the only characters who got to meet everyone because he, he interviews everybody. And he, you know, he goes, Holy shit, man, how'd you get all these? How do you get all these fucking people in your little movie? Because I know what it costs right. to make. And you don't have a lot of money, but you know, we shot in the height of COVID. I mean, so it was like, it was a time when a lot of people really were eager to work. And, right. you know, the script stood out to them enough for them to want to fly to Utah and make it for not a lot of money. But it was, yeah, it was quite a cast. You know, it set the bar very high because it's my, you know, it's my first movie. Using forgeries and bogus identities, Matthew B. Cox, one of the most ingenious con men in history built America's biggest banks out of millions. Despite numerous encounters with bank security, state, and federal authorities, Cox narrowly, and quite luckily, avoided capture for years. Eventually, he topped the U.S. Secret Service's most wanted list and led the U.S. Marshals, FBI, and Secret Service on a three-year chase. 
while jet-setting around the world with his attractive female accomplices. Cox has been declared one of the most prolific mortgage fraud con artists of all time by CNBC's American Greed. Bloomberg Businessweek called him the mortgage industry's worst nightmare, while Dateline NBC described Cox as a gifted forger and silver-tongued liar. Playboy magazine proclaimed his scam was real estate fraud, and he was the best. Shark in the housing pool is Cox's exhilarating first-person account of his stranger-than-fiction story. Available now on Amazon and Audible. Your story's got to be a movie, man. Watching that on. Well, listen, on, I hear uh, that. I hear that all the time, and I the mistakes I've already made are so. Like when I first got out, I was contacted by multiple people, and I immediate, or, you know, producers, and I kept shifting them to stories I'd written. Mm. And I was like, ah, I'm not really interested in doing my thing right now, you know, because. I don't even know why. I think I thought a movie was so out of reach that I was trying to kind of establish myself as as a writer. Like I wanted right. to be a writer or I wanted to start a true crime podcast or something, which I thought the bar would be lower. It was a an easier entry point. You know, and so I just didn't pursue those things, any of those um, opportunities. Right. And then... You know, I started doing some some speaking. I, I started doing a bunch of um, uh, podcasts. And then I started, people started being interested in the stories. And so that kind of tar started to take off. And now yeah. that I'm thinking I should probably focus on trying to get something done with my story. Um, you know, of course, those I haven't, I've never really looked. It's always been people coming to me. So I don't even yeah. know where to start <clears throat> to try and start that because i was focusing on documentaries yeah now now i'm at the point where people are, are starting to ask me about you know um scripted you know what about a scripted series for this true crime story you wrote or this one or this one or, or what about yours and um so I, ha I i need to look into that i need to definitely need to and then you made that comment it's funny when you made that comment you know i don't know if it, you know half jokingly or whatever it was I told Jess, I said, you know what's my, sorry, my wife, her name's Jess. I said, you know, I said, what's funny is I said, when he joked about that, that was, I said, and after seeing the movie he made with the budget he had, I said, that's the first time I thought, no, that could happen. Yeah. Like that, that actually is possible. I, I think it's, I, I wasn't joking. I'm, I'm serious. I, I watched the American greed and you know what I love about it. I'm kind of into crime without too much violence you know and what i love about your you know like it's funny because american murderer was like marketed in a very you know like guns on the cover but you saw it it's not really that kind of movie you know right. they do that to sell it and like give it some suspense but it's really a drama about characters and i think it's really interesting how that whole story with you plays out of it's a relationship you know, it's a fascinating, like, you know, you have like a, a bit of a lovers on the run, like as they called it on American Greed, the Bonnie and Clyde, but right. it's really just, I don't think it would be too expensive to make. You know, you're not, that's, that's the beauty of these crime films is a lot of the, you know, what really dictates a production is cast. You know, that's, right. that's what, you know, like certain actors mean certain amounts of money, you know, and it really, but like the, what it comes down to is roles, you know, are there good roles? And like, you know, for you and like Rebecca and even the first girl in the, you know, and a cop and an investigator, like you get four good people for that who have some quote unquote, like foreign value and you're off to the races making a movie. Like it's really, it really comes down to script. And that's the part of why I think a lot of things don't get off the ground is because they don't have scripts, you know? And like, it's so a lot of people can be like, Oh, well, there's a cool story about an article, but like, how does mortgage fraud play out? How do you make that cool and cinematic? You know, what does that look like? Right. So, but if you have a script, that's really banger. And, you know, if I had the time, you know, or if it comes to, I mean, I do write a lot of scripts on spec. Like that could be something we could discuss later is, you know, if there's some article or a book or something you wrote or whatever. Well, I was actually going to say, if you go to my, my website, so I wrote a book, it's like, I think it's like a hundred thousand words. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, at this point ask you to read it. 
Um, but I did write a 7,000 word article. Well, it's yeah. a, a synopsis of my book and it's on my website. My website is called insidetruecrime.com. Yeah. And so did you read it? No, I didn't read it, but I, but so it, it's, I a know synopsis, you're it's a synopsis of my story. It's much more, it is much more, um, you know, correct than the, than the American greed. Yeah. yeah. Not that the American greed, I mean, obviously they're try they try and make you look as bad as you're po possible. And it's like, I don't need any help. So, you know, <laughs> right. you know, not, and it's not that I didn't give them the material. Uh, and it was funny when I first saw it, like, I was like, that's not right. And that's not what happened. And that's not now, you know, then you start writing and, you know, and I, now I look back and I'm like, yeah, it's pretty accurate. Like, I'm not <laughs> thrilled that they said this and they could have gone with this angle and that angle, but it is pretty accurate. Uh, yeah. So, you know, there are some things that they, that happened in the American greed. They talk about in the American greed that it's like, okay, well, I didn't know that, you know, like, like the, the Browns, the, the doctor, you know, that they, they do this whole thing on how they had this sick child and they had, I don't know. I was, I never met them until the day of the closing. They right. make it seem like I knew them. I went in their house. I, we had dinner. I met their children. Like I walked into yeah. a vacant house and three weeks later I went to a closing. Yeah. That's yeah. No, no. So, right. so no, not they, that I'm, yeah, not no, that I'm, I'm not a scumbag. I, I'm not saying I'm not a scumbag, but let's be accurate. I'm just a scumbag <laughs> yeah. that didn't realize that specific thing. That's uh, you, you, you were, you were, you're not anymore. That's what I said. Yeah. <laughs> so let me, <laughs> um, let me, let me, let me do the intro real quick. Cause let's otherwise, jump, let, yeah, let's jump in, but yeah, be. let's talk about that down the road. Cause you know, I'm, I'm signing with an agent soon and, um, you know, they're going to ask me about projects. I have, you know, a pretty full slate, but I do love the story. So, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll continue that conversation. We'll do the interview now, but let's keep All that right. conversation open. Cause I, I'm interested and I, I could see a path for it. Um, you know, so let's, yeah, I'll read that and get back to you, but we'll, yeah, let's keep that convo open. Yeah. So, uh, well, one, obviously, uh, I was connected to you and I watched the film through, uh, I think through Tyler, right? Yep. You don't, I don't even think, you know, you probably have multiple people. I, so anyway, I think, I think it was Tyler who connected. I think, it was, I, I think that's right. Yeah. And, and then I ended up watching, uh, watching, or, you know, you sent me the link to your movie. I ended up buying it on YouTube because we couldn't watch it on our TV. So I was like, I'm just going to buy it. Oh uh, yeah. So it's on yeah. Hulu now too. Um, it's I know, but I just now, but... dropped Hulu like two months ago. <laughs> I get paid or I was paying whatever, 12, 13 bucks a month. And we, we never watched it. I so, get it, man. You hire your subscriptions. So, okay. So let's start with, you know, basically where, where were, uh, where'd you grow up? I'm from Brooklyn, New York. Yeah. Originally okay. I, I've been in Los Angeles now for 10 years, but uh, I am always a New Yorker at heart. You know, I grew up in the city. And I grew up in Brooklyn Heights specifically, which is a really, which is an awesome place to, to come of age, you know, having access to the art scene. And, you know, I grew up loving movies and the theater. So it, it was a really, really cool place to, to grow up and, and to visit all the time. Yeah. I, I actually just went to New York uh, maybe six months ago for the first time. You never been. Oh, wow. I'd never been. So, and I, I only, I went up to do a shoot for, a TV show called um, My True Crime Story, which is on like VH1. And they did like a one hour episode. You know, it was horrible. You know, the, the, yeah. like they put makeup on me and it's obvious. And they're, oh, no, no, you won't even know. I'm like, man, this looks horrible. What are you guys doing? And, <laughs> you know, um, but, you know, my uh, my wife and I went, to, went out there and, you know, and, and listen, I'd never been. So, you know, when you're from Tampa, Florida, and you go to New York, it's like, this is, this is insane. The yeah. amount of buildings, you know, just it, it's, it is, it's overwhelming. And then we went, you know, we went to um, Times Square. We actually stayed not far from Times Square. So uh, we were there for like three days and, and then we came back. But um, so how, when did you, so you grew up there? Was it just you uh, or do you have brothers, sisters? Tons. I'm from an Italian Jewish family. So both sides procreate <laughs> or to procreation i have uh four siblings totals two brothers two sisters um 
yeah, big, big family, big Italian Jewish family. Did you go to art school? Did you know you wanted to be uh, or film school? I did. You know, I grew up, like I said, loving movies. Um, you know, fortunately for me, my dad showed me the good stuff <laughs> when I was young. I, I, you know, the film that really made me want to be a filmmaker was Dog Day Afternoon. Um, you know, with Al Pacino. I saw that when yeah. I was twelve. I saw it when I was twelve years old. My dad rented it and showed it to me. I just fell in love with the movie, the characters. You know, also it's set in Brooklyn on a hot August summer day, and you know, it just really the movie really spoke to me. And I didn't know why at that age. You know, at age twelve. At 12 that's a pretty. Yeah, you don't know why, but I, movie. <laughs> I know it's so good though. And you know what I love about that film is, you know, yes, it's intense and you know, it's a bank robbery movie. It's the bank robbery movie, really. But it's also really funny and kind of offbeat in a weird way, you know, and, and I just, and Al Pacino's performance, John Cazale's performance. I mean, the whole film is just such a masterpiece. So I watched that movie when I was 12 and just really loved it, kept watching it again and again. And uh, one day for, you know, I was walking down the streets of Times Square with my mom and my brother, and they used to sell screenplays on street stands, like little vendors. Um, you know, it printed scripts off like drewscriptorama.com, which was like this weird website that had screen. It was one of the only websites that had screenplays on the internet and you could read them. And uh, they would sell these screenplays for like 10 bucks of scripts. You could get the script for The Godfather for 10 bucks or Pulp Fiction or whatever you wanted, all movies I loved. But they had the script for Dog Day Afternoon. My mom sees me eyeing it. She buys it for me for 10 bucks as the sixth night of Hanukkah present for this weird 12 year old. And I read that script by Frank Pearson, and that was the first time I learned what a screenplay was and understood that, like, okay, words on a page can become images on a screen. You know, that's that that was just this whole new concept for me that totally broke my mind open. Um, you know, and I also loved visual storytelling. I found film images fascinating. You know, I actually, I know you're an artist and a painter, and, and I've started to draw and paint myself just in my spare time. Uh, taking classes i didn't do that as a kid i kind of wish i did but for some reason it just all it was all film i was just obsessed with film and cinema and exploring different kinds you know it started with 70s movies and i also grew up loving tcm which i still have literally on mute <laughs> in my office all day when i write um so i loved old films you know films from the 40s films from the 50s and just and then foreign films so kind of exploring different you know types of 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 cinema, but particularly, you know, growing up in New York in an Italian family, of course, the guys you always talk about are Martin Scorsese, you know, the genius, right. and Francis Ford Coppola, the other genius, you know, and then Steven Spielberg and all of them. So, you know, I, I grew up loving all kinds of movies, but I didn't really know how one, you know, forges a career in film. You know, it just was kind of like, you know, I'm from a family of like lawyers, you know, <laughs> like it just wasn't, you know, nobody had really done that kind of thing before. Ironically, my brother and I are both artistic. My brother is a uh, pianist and conductor, and he's also the composer of American Murder. It's his first film score. Um, okay. So that's his music in the film that you heard. And, um, you know, but he's like, he, he was someone who like, he was like a wonderkind with music. I didn't, you know, early on, I didn't, I just loved movies. I was a nerd. I didn't necessarily show much promise per se, but I did start making shorts in high school. And, you know, I acted too in theater and plays and, and I loved that. But again, I didn't really know how to build a path. I went to a liberal arts college, you know, Connecticut college, small school, um, you know, where again, most people from that school don't, yeah, there's, there's a film program, but there's not much of one, you know, it was just like, I did, I did English and film studies and, you know, I did a semester abroad though in Prague at a film school. And that experience was the first time I had like the art school experience, like film conservatory, pure, you know, cinema, like study, you know, it was a really amazing film program in Prague where they had like the great Czech filmmakers had all gone there. And some of them were even teaching there. And I was just like, dumb 20 you know 19 year old kid like getting to learn from all these masters and that experience made me say okay i want to you know i think it's directing for me that's what i have to do i made a short film there based on a hemingway story and i said that's this is what i gotta do and after that i uh you know i got out of college like every you know 22 year old college grad having you know unemployed and not knowing what to do with my life you know wanting to be a filmmaker like every you know like everyone and their mom and uh you know i 
I got a job working in the mailroom at the William Morris Endeavor Talent Agency, um, you know, which was a pretty cool place to be for a 22 year old because it was just like the hub of everything entertainment. And that was about 10 years ago. So it was a really interesting time because the industry as we know it was completely changing, you know, it was right. shifting. It, it, you know, it, 2012, 2013, the year I was there, that was the year House of Cards came out on Netflix, right? And like, you know, movie stars were suddenly doing tv movies right like behind the candelabra with michael douglas and matt damon so it was a really interesting time to be a you know 21 year old or 22 year old like you know <laughs> being like what they call a floater right just doing whatever the agents want us to do and you know getting to see all these different you know connections and how this industry works and how it was just changing faster than anyone could comprehend um i worked there for about a year and a half worked for a great talent agent um and then I got into film school at AFI, um, you know, at the AFI Conservatory, American Film Institute, which, you know, I applied on a lark. I applied with a short film I had made with a one week's paycheck, which at the time was like $650. <laughs> and, you know, just made a short film shot in a weekend, sent it into AFI, and uh, they accepted me. I was the youngest director there. I was the last one in. You know, I was waitlisted and, you know, <laughs> I really hustled my way in. And when I got there, I, almost felt as if I was on borrowed time because I just, I knew, you know, I had to work really hard because I was let in last, <laughs> you know, like I was, they accept 28 directors out of like 10,000 applicants or something at the time, at least. And so I was like, okay, you're number 28. Like you gotta, you gotta work your ass off and really, you know, make the most of this experience. And so I worked and worked and worked and made short after short and, you know, failed and got better and then succeeded and failed again, you know, just as the process is. And then I graduated with a thesis film that ended up really opening a lot of doors for me. It was called Frontman, and that won the student Emmy and, you know, got a lot of recognition in terms of like the festival circuit. But it's kind of like, you know, a weird thing where how do you now take this and make a living? How do you live you know, and survive? And uh, when I graduated school, you know, I was kind of, I was getting like gigs, like shooting, like, you know, branding content things or reality, you know, like anything. Like I had a, I, I got lucky that somebody was hiring me to do kind of like this weird kind of like cooking show stuff. And like, it was, it was very sketchy things. Like it wasn't porn, thank God, but it was like, you know, a cooking show for someone who can't really cook. <laughs> it's like this weird and but me and my friends would do it and you know friends from afi we'd all go we'd film it we'd make some money we'd get drunk and talk about it and it was like a thing you know it was just you know we were going gig to gig and that wasn't really sustainable it seemed i i then after that made another short and that these two shorts from men and law men were kind of going around the festival circuits at the same time and a lot of people were interested in working with me but it was kind of like hard because i had to really figure out what my first feature was because that's the thing with it being a director specifically and a screenwriter as well but a director is it's really what's your first feature you know if you make a successful short what happens is they kind of go that's cool what do you got and i had put all this effort into the shorts that i didn't really have that feature script yet i'd gotten sent a couple but i couldn't really you know see how i would do them so it was about 2017 when i decided you know i got if i'm gonna do my own short film if I'm going to do my own feature film, I'm going to have to write it myself. Like that's, like it kind of came to that. I was like, I want to do a feature film that I'm going to be proud of. That's my debut that, you know, is me and what I want to say and like the kind of movie I want to make, you know, then I have to, I'm going to have to write the script. So it was quite a big curve where I really had to figure out how to, you know, take all this and turn that into screenwriting and really did essentially. Have, sorry, did you have something in mind? Like, did you already have something like you thought? I would, this is something I could do or a, a concept or a, a book I had, you wanted to. I had kicked around different ideas, um, you know, and I was thinking maybe I'll make something really small, like super micro budget, just go shoot it and like, you know, but I, I'd been kicking around different ideas. And then I want to say it was around 2018. I was like, just in this weird place. Like, how do you, how do you do it? How do you make that first feature? And going to cut back in time in a nonlinear narrative here. 14 years earlier, before I wanted to be a filmmaker for real, I wanted to be an FBI agent. And I used to go on the FBI's most wanted website. I looked at the fugitives and I found them fascinating. I would like, you know, look at the fugitives. My mom used to recall me being like, hey, that's, you know, fugitive number five, like as a kid, you know, and I wanted to be a fed and catch the bad guys and blah, blah, blah. And uh, in 2004, the crime at the center of American murder took place. So I was about 13, 14 years old. 
And I remember I saw Jason Derrick Brown's mugshot for the first time on the FBI's most wanted fugitives website, you know, and you had a sea of menacing faces like Osama bin Laden, Whitey Bulger, you know, like, like top 10, top 10 people, which I know you know about. And, um, you know, the, uh, and Jason Derrick Brown just stood out, you know, cause here was a surfer dude with spiky hair, green eyes. He just didn't really fit the bill. So I kind of like, you know, again, at, at age 13 or 14, all I remember was the image of Jason, like the spiky hair against the blue wall, you know, which is the picture he took before he, like when he bought the gun for the, for the murder that he committed. But I remember that image, the face made an impression on me. And now I cut to 14 years later, I'm figuring out, I'm in my late twenties I'm figuring out how the hell do I take all I've learned to make a living at this thing. Right. Um, you know, what would be a good first feature for me to do anyway in this crazy landscape where like it's hard to get movies financed and what is it? And literally I'm 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 shooting a commercial for a dentistry firm, right? And I'm I'm in Texas in a hotel storyboarding and drawing out my images. And whenever I storyboard, I always have true crime stuff on in the background. Um, American greed in the on the background. And Jason Derrick Brown's face popped on my television, like boom. His face goes full screen and I see it. And all of a sudden the image comes flooding back. I'm like, oh yeah, I'm like that guy. And I turn the volume up and I start watching the special and I start seeing, I'm like, this is so interesting. This guy, right. And the special that aired about him, because Jason's story had been covered on multiple formats at Dateline, American Greed, at like everything, you know? Right. And I just became upset i was just like this is so crazy that this guy did this thing and he disappeared and no one knows where he is still and these people all knew him but they all nobody saw him doing this murder like it was so surprising to everyone that i just said this is the kind of character that was in movies that i grew up loving you know this is pacino and dog day afternoon this is you know anti-heroes this is french connection i just i was like how have they not made a film about this guy <coughs> excuse me so I just, um, you know, I became obsessed and really interested in the story. And I just said, well, what if I make that as my first feature? And at first I thought it seemed pretty bold, you know, because it, it would, you know, it's an ambitious story. A lot happens in it, you know. But the more I looked at it, I said, well, you know, maybe I'll just write the script and see what happens from there. You know, just write a script about this character, follow him, see where it goes. So I began to research it. I did a real deep dive and... You know, began reading everything I could, even interviewing, you know, some people who were either connected or, you know, peripherally connected to the to the Jason in the story. And I just began to amass, you know, material. And I just said, okay, I'm going to go write a script. And, you know, I spent a, a long time trying to get the script right before I would send it out. And, you know, it, that began the journey, though, essentially, of getting American Murder made, which was a long one with a lot of false starts and stops, you know. Um, but essentially, yeah, I was, you know, at a place in my life where I was just trying to figure out what's that first feature, what does it look like? And then Jason's face just popped on my television and kind of told me to make it. If that I don't know if that sounds cheesy, but you know, it's the truth. It really just kind of came to me and was like, Yeah, this is this is the story you're you should do for your first movie. So unfortunately, were, people yeah. Sorry, sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say, who was the production company? Who who'd you end up who ended ended up, you know, producing it? It was two different companies. Um, Traveling Picture Show Company um, was the main one, and GG Films. Um, they kind of converged on me at the same time. I mean, the path for it was I wrote the spec, um, you know, spec script meaning for those who don't know, you know, script you write on your own, you know, right? On your on your own time, on your own dime, and then you go try to sell it. So I wrote the screenplay on spec, and uh, it wasn't the first script I'd ever written, but it was one of them. It was maybe like my my third or fourth, and. Um, I wrote it and an early draft I did, you know, got an actor interested um, with that actor who was starting to get some heat in his career. Sorry, they're drilling outside um, with an actor who was starting to get uh, heat in his career. He attached himself and did a proof of concept short. Um, I shot so I shot one scene from the script and, uh, you know, was taking that around and that short with that actor helped get eyeballs on it people were like oh i want to read can i read this can i read the script and there were a few different companies that were interested um some of which you know want were actually interested in 
potentially optioning my script, but not necessarily with me directing it. And I didn't want to do that because it was very specifically written for me to direct. So right. I was kind of like, you know, in a tough place because I did need the money. <laughs> but I also was just like, no, I, you know, if, if people want to option it without me, maybe someone will option it with me. Um, you know, and then fortunately I was right, even though it took uh, a bit of time. And uh, this company, Traveling Picture Show and GG Films, converged around the same time. I want to say like, you know, early 2019. And, you know, they were like, let's go, let's do this. And, um, you know, they optioned the script for me. And that was my first time, you know, having a script option sold and then doing rewrites. And, you know, it was a really informative and uh, learning, you know, learning by fire kind of experience. But uh, it was great. And thank God for them, because without, you know, your producers often get a bad rap (laughs) for like the, you know, like what's known about them but the truth is without them you don't get a movie made you know you right. and the hustle that's required on them to like go and raise financing and like put you know in a way they actually are risking the most you know um and uh so it was you know i was very grateful to these producers because they really understood what i wanted to do and got me and got the movie and were also really supported me directing it that was crucial um so yeah, Traveling Picture Show and uh, GG Films were the two. Where where has it played? Uh, the movie. Well, we um, you know, so we shot the film in twenty late twenty twenty early twenty twenty one. Um, we finished it at the end at the end of twenty twenty one, top of twenty two. And uh, you know, we so really when you think about where the movie was made, it was made in covid in the thick of right. it, like thick of the pandemic shot in pre-vaccine covid in utah so you know it was kind of an odd time to be putting a movie out and trying to get one sold um we actually sold the film uh to lionsgate saban and universal um before it was you know like well obviously before it was released but we sold it in, in early i want to say march 2022 and then we were able to we had some amazing festival premieres um our world premiere was at the Terramina Film Fest, which is in Sicily, um, and it premiered in a amphitheater that was built in 300 BC, and uh, it was really awesome. That festival was amazing, and I got to meet my my hero of all time, uh, Francis Ford Coppola, was there with the 50th anniversary of The Godfather. Um, that was pretty special. So that was that was an amazing premiere to have. I it's kind of tough to honestly beat that, you know. Right. Um, especially because you work so hard on the movie and it's endless hours. I mean, you know, you're, you're giving your life to it and you're, you're, you know, you're, you're going in and you're doing that cut and you're doing that extra cut and you're watching it for the 50 millionth time and you're taking notes and you're figuring it out. So to, to be able to have had that was pretty amazing. And yeah, we had a world premiere there in June of last year. Uh, that was a Terramina. Then it played a few more festivals. Um, West coast It played Newport beach. That was like our Hollywood industry premiere which was great that was a packed house and really fun um you know and then it also played boston was its east coast premiere which was awesome um it won awards at san diego and fayetteville which is great um so you know we we played like i want to say five five or six festivals which you know when you're about to release a movie you don't want to overexpose it so it was a good amount and you know the um and we got you know our european exposure which was great and um then it came out theatrically in the u.s in late october early november and it was released on streaming about a week or two after so i mean we got a theatrical release you know which is very rare these days especially for small movies like this and then it came out internationally in january of this year where it really started to to, to take off um, and top streaming charts all around the world. Um, but it actually, I just found out today uh, from my team that it, uh, it topped it's in the Hulu top 10 as of this morning. So it's, it's, it's had a nice growing organic life, which has been cool to see because I've, you know, since it came out uh, other than I, I promoted the hell out of it <laughs> in as many interviews as I could, but then I've, I've been on to other projects since it came out in November. So it's, it's nice to get remote, you know, to be told, you know how it's doing um every now and then someone will send me an article or something i'm like that's great you know so it's nice to see it's kind of like you raise a kid and then you send it off into the <laughs> ether and there's a phrase about uh raising kids that applies to movies not that i have an experience raising a kid i'm not a father but um they say raising him raising a kid making movies like raising a kid it takes 25 years to know 
if you did a really good job, <laughs> meaning like in 25 years, are people talking right. about it or are they, you know, to disappear. So, you know, um, it will take 25 years before I know how good of a job I did, but I'm very proud of the film and proud of the people who worked on it and who made me look great and the reception it's had and all that's been, been awesome. You know? Um, like, I, I mean, so if you said you researched, so had anybody, well, I mean, you said there was some, some shows about him and he had been thoroughly, you know, kind of, um, they're, you know, gone through the, I guess the true crime kind of, um, documentary type series or whatever, but had anybody written a book about him or like, so did you have to start from scratch and just do all your own research and. I had to do a lot of it. You know, there was, like I said, a lot written about him. I think there were a couple books from what I remember. Um, a lot of articles, um, you know, a ton of articles. There was like an out of print book. I mean, there, there was so much out there, documentaries, interviews, shows, those kinds of, of things. Um, and you know, I did, I, I did my homework and that I really like, I did reach out to some people. I reached out to a cop who worked the case. I reached out to, you know, or a cop who knew the cop who worked the case and was able to give me, you know, documents. And I, I was able to, I interviewed some people who knew him. I don't want to say exactly who, just cause I don't want to out them. It's kind of my <laughs> unspoken deal with them. But, right. you know, I, I did interview people who knew him and, you know, the movie, I always stress when I say this, it is, it is a true crime film and it is based on a true story. And I have had people reach out to me and say who, who did know Jason and say how accurate it is, which I'm very proud of. Um, but you know, I did, it's a painting, it's not a photograph. So there are definitely, you know, liberties I took to tell the story more dramatically and, you know, cause real life often doesn't play out like a movie and yeah. that's the challenge of making you know, films based on true stories and often a controversial subject, you know, it's like how true was it? What wasn't true? And I always say it is based on truth and reality, you know, in particular things like the murder scene was, you know, are quite, I mean, it, it was a different kind of movie theater in that, you know, there weren't those kinds of pillars. There were like longer alleyways, but we recreated that with pretty painfully, you know, painstaking detail and accuracy to make sure like how it was done happened and, and all that. And I've had people, you know, remark that, which is great, but um, you know, I wasn't necessarily striving for accuracy as much as I was more for emotional truth is in what did it feel like to know this guy? You know, how did this guy manipulate people? How did people, you know, fall for this web? And that's really what the movie was about was, you know, can you take someone who's you know, quite rotten to the core essentially? And, you know, can you push an audience to, understand him you know and uh understand who he is because that's what the films i grew up loving did you know and and not grew up loving still love you know I, I love movies that live in that moral gray area whether it's goodfellas or you know wolf of wall street right i mean you know those movies are so great and the the characters get away with it <laughs> you know? like at the end of goodfellas my favorite part is at the end of they, or, they, they didn't get they all went to go they still all went to jail I'm not sure how they much were. Well, oh, yeah, dead. I guess Henry Hill did, but they got no, away with a lot, but eventually catches up with you. That's true. But, you know, I, I well, I, what I love about it, the Goodfellas, I, I remember hearing an interview with Scorsese where he was saying a lot of people were outraged when Goodfellas, even though it was a very beloved film, people were really pissed off that like Henry Hill didn't get like, you know, slapped on the wrist or like cuffed right at the end. Like he's he's living in witness protection. Right. And he's complaining about the pasta. And you know, people are like, oh, come on. Like, you know, he needs some poetic justice. And I, I just love movies that explore, you know, that psyche and that psychology and, and, and allow you to really, you know, look at that character in an unflinching way that tells you, you know, this is who this person was. They were, you know, they deceived people. They did this, they were violent, you know, all of that. And uh, I, I just, yeah, I love those kinds of films. So that's what I was striving to do with this. Um, well, one, I was going to say, you know, it's funny, like, uh, uh, Jordan Belford or, uh, Henry Hill, or, you know, it, it's always funny when people are like, oh, they should throw away, they should have given that guy 30 years. Well, then, then he wouldn't have cooperated if he said, oh, you're going to give me 30 years. Yeah, that's it. You're getting 30 years. Okay. Well then I'm not going to cooperate. And now all these other people go free. The really bad people go free. So what right. do you want? It's like, you have to make a deal. Do you want to get these other 15 people who are who are murderers and participated or you want to get one out of the 15 people 
So you can get yeah. me or you're going to, or, and I can help you get the other 14 or 15, you know? So, but I'm not doing that because I'm just a wonderful person now. I didn't get right. arrested and I'm, I become a good citizen. Like I need something. You don't work for free. You know what right. I'm saying? Like, that's what, I, you know, you only have at that point in their lives, like you only have one thing to offer me, you know, which is tough. totally. So, yeah. But yeah, I was, you know, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I was just gonna say, I, I, cause I hear that all the time. Oh, that person should get 30 years. Well, wait a minute. You know? Yeah. No. And I, well, I, that's, you know, and I, I don't think it's films or cinema. It's not pretentious. I don't think it's cinema's place to judge, you know? Right. I think, yeah. You know, we present, you know, our job as a director, screenwriter is to present, you know, and I, we're fascinated by it. You know, I mean, like, why, why does everyone love succession? Why is everyone talking about it? You know, because, you know, I, I think those creators are not judging their characters, even though they're all fucking awful. <laughs> like, you know, if you want to give someone time in prison, give it to those people, you know, like they're, they're awful, you know, and they don't, and they get away with every, you know, so I think film, our job is to, you know, present someone and like show you who they are and, you know, not judge because I, I don't think people listen to judgments. You know, that's just been right. my experience. You know, the audiences well, don't want to be lectured to. It's that's you know, no fun. And, and when when the Wolf of Wall Street came out, you know, people were saying he didn't talk about the victims. He didn't show the listen. Nobody nobody wants to go to the movies and 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 be crying their eyes out for the victims and for they're there to see some. They're there to vicariously live through these anti-heroes, you know, you can yeah. bring it up, but you certainly can't dwell, you know, dwell on it. You dwell on it, then you don't sell any tickets and then you don't get your next movie made. Like it's no, a Wolf bargain. Wall, yeah. Well, a Wolf of Wall Street is brilliant. And I think, well, you know, the best part about it is, yeah, they don't really show the victims of the movie. That's true. But they show Kyle Chandler riding the subway at the end. Right. right. <laughs> like, and that's the one moment that I love it. It's so brilliant. Yeah, no, I I completely agree. I, I think and that's part of the fun of con man movies. You know, you think right. about even a movie like The Sting, you know, which is not, you know, that dark per se, right? It's pretty like as far as crime. Yeah. Pretty lighthearted. But you know, like the, the fun is being in on the con. I mean, every time I've seen my film with in a theater with a crowd, which was a few times, you know, in Italy, you know, in Boston in California, like some a lot of scenes get laughter, which I'm proud of because I think a lot of crime stuff these days is just way too like dark and ominous and like you know cops being serious with cigarettes and you know I'm just like fuck right. that you know I like to watch things that make me have fun and you know the audience always cracks up in the scene when uh, Tom Jason Tom Pelfrey's character Jason Dark Brown puts the golf clubs in his pants and walks yeah, out of the I, Right. They always laugh at that because it's a con and you're in on it. You know, the brothers doing, you know, it's just like people just love that. And audiences, I think, love cons, at least people that seek those kinds of stories out. And, you know, in my film, I think we, we do show a little bit of the victim with Adina Menzel's character and certainly um, the sister, you know, who who by being this con man sister was it was in a tough position um you know in a compromised one and uh you know but i think that it's uh you know yeah i think what you, you can have fun part of i think the fun of film noir and gangster and all that is you kind of get to like as you said you I know mean, i totally agree it's you live vicariously through the thrill so that when right. the audience walks out they don't have to do it you know that's why we love movies like double indemnity where it's like you know, they're getting off on this plan to kill her husband, right? It's like, you know, that's the fun of film noir is you go down to these dark alleys, but you don't, ideally you don't do, you know, no one should do that in their, in their life. <laughs> so I have a question. Um, and I mean, this might, it, I don't know if it's an off topic or odd question, not that you're going to know, but it just, what bothered me so much about the movie, or is that not the movie, it's just the, the story or case in general is that it's, you know, I guess it's, I know a lot about crime, obviously. And I've spoken with, you know, thousands of criminals and yeah. I've with tons of bank robbers and I've t spoken with, you know, ha to probably a couple dozen guys that actually robbed like, you know, armored trucks and, and actually robbed the carriers, you know, the, the guys, um, you know, carrying the money back and forth or the, I forget what they call them, the couriers. Uh, anyway, like he, like, it's such a senseless murder. 
you know, and, and I was just the whole time when he said, you know, you this and this, and I've been watching him this. And when he tells his little buddy, all you got to do is shoot the guy first, and, you know, go up and shoot the guy. I thought, why does someone have to get shot at all? Like, what are you talking about? Like, I was okay with you robbing the guy, you know, <laughs> shitty thing to do, but I get it. This guy's making minimum wage, maybe a little bit more. He's not going to put up a fight for that money. You run up. I know a guy that got 200, I think he got $250,000 robbed a uh, a guy delivering money to Bank of America, ran up with bear mace. He didn't have a gun. He ran up with bear mace. Boom, Anthony Curcio ran, did the same thing. Watched for a few days, got down, got the, uh, the pattern down, knew when they were going to be there. Just ran up, boom, shot him in the face with bear mace. The guy hit the ground, started screaming, grabbed the money and ran. Why do you have to kill this guy? Yeah. You don't have, they never put up a fight. You have a gun. He's going to be like, whoa, bro, take it. Go, go. He's not like he just he executes him. And yeah. I, I just thought it was so from the, the character that you created, you know, and what you're saying was extremely accurate. It was so out of character. When he said that, I thought, wow, like this guy who I kind of you like as the lovable rogue. You know what I'm saying? He's kind of a um, yeah. Jack Sparrow kind of a. You love him. You hate him. You know he's a scoundrel, but you love him. You're rooting right. for him. When he did that, I went, wow, man. Like, what are you doing? It yeah. So It was nuts. Like, and I was wondering, like, in all your research, like, did that ever come up? Did you ever think, like, what did that, did, did people say, like, I, we have no idea. Like, it was just, clearly he thought about it. He, it, was, it was, that was his intent from the yeah. movie. Yeah, you know, it's one of those crazy unsolved mysteries. You know, so much about this story and this case from like his disappearance, you know, to his dad's disappearance. You know, there's just so many questions where I think we're never going to get answers to, you know, why did he do that? Um, and it was surprising. I, I think that's part of why it was the murder was so surprising to hear about because people knew him as kind of a fun, loving, immature man child who, you know, right. you just enjoy your time with and that's it. Um, you know, he wasn't like, he didn't seem to be this complicated, but the truth is Jason was a very skilled actor, you know, and he had demons and he had darkness and, you know, as far as going that extra length to, to kill someone, there's, you know, again, no, there is no one answer for why he did. I think there's, you know, I, I would say the de possibly the desensitization to how desensitized he was to violence, you know, um, and I think that is something the film does explore somewhat, you know, not in too much in depth because we didn't have time, but, you know, it, how prevalent it is in our culture, you know, in, in movies and in, in shows. I mean, one thing I'm very, I'm also, I would say I'm proud of is that the film, you know, is called American Murderer, but it's not that violent, um, you know, but I, I will tell you, I, I had, uh, but the one scene of violence that you're talking about or the main scene of violence is disturbing, not because of how much violence there is in it, but because of the nature of it, that this murder happened in broad daylight, you know, at a place where people literally go to shop and watch movies and have, you know, a mall. And that's what I think is so, you know, catches people off guard about it. It's like the nature, because right, you know, you're totally right that murder and even armed robbery are not, you know, are pretty basic crimes, <laughs> armed, or, you know, armored car theft. Like there's been a million movies about armored car theft. But the nature of this one is particularly, yeah, there's something disturbing about it. And it was a very disturbing scene to film. It, it, you know, the, the day on set was quite felt heavy. And my brother scoring it, I know, like, <laughs> this was like, dude, I can't, like, I'm, you, you got to stop giving me notes on this cue because I can't watch it again. Like, it's getting really, you know, it was, it was, a, it was a scene that, you know, it is unflinching and disturbing. And, and that was the point of the point of the movie was to, really and it and in that way it's a bit of an experiment in that we're sticking you with this guy who's charismatic and fun to be around exactly as you said the lovable rogue um you know you know he's doing bad things but you're kind of fine with it and then you see him do this thing and really at that point it's you know all bets are off at that point you know now you know you are with someone who is homicidal who is dangerous and who is willing to you know take someone's life for his own financial comfort i mean it's disturbing and sick what I was going to say is, you know, had I not known watching the movie, had I not known that he was on the FBI's most wanted list, that he had committed the murder, even when he mentions it, I thought I would have thought, you know, one, he's not going to go through with it. 
And two, if he is, he's not shooting anybody. So I only, you know, like even during the movie, I, I would have been, had I just walked in cold and seen it and then he, and he did shoot him, I would have really been like just blown away. But luckily I kind of knew it was coming. So, you know, you're reserved the whole time. I'm like, yeah, this, he is going to kill this guy. Um, the other yeah. thing that I thought was great was that the father, I thought the way you did the father fit with his dad, I genuinely thought there were two things. The father... I either thought the father was dead, like he'd killed him. He had killed himself or he was in prison. You know what I'm saying? You leave it vague. And I almost felt, and and because my wife was like, she's like, I don't understand. Did, did he die? Did he? I go, no. I said, I think he's in prison. And then, you know, so that's, that's just what I, ex I expected was that he was in prison because it wasn't clear to me that he had disappeared. Right. You know, they don't mention it again. So when the brother at the end is like, you're never going to catch him. And the, the FBI agent goes, you know, why do you say that? And, and he's like, you never called my father. And I was right. like, oh, wow. Like the yeah. dad's the con kind of a con man. The, yeah. the son's are kind of a con man. They both disappeared. So yeah. I didn't. Yeah. And then the brother, it, then the brother say, have you talked to dad lately or something like that? I think during the yeah. course, they were playing golf or something. And I remember thinking, oh, he, he's in, he is in prison. Yeah, so I just it's funny. Prison. Yeah, no, it's it's an it's a it's a thread of the movie. I wish we had a little more time to explore. You know, this is the tough part about films versus limited series. Is in a limited series where you get like six to eight episodes, and in the case of American Murder, we had a hundred minutes. You know, more or less. Um, so you know, I I wish I could have explored that thread further in depth. But yeah, no, the father disappeared in 1994, ten years before Jason did, and. Um, by all accounts, uh, you know, the Jason and his father had a strange relationship. The dad was, you know, but they were definitely like one another, you know, and, and Jason was very much coached, uh, by his father. Um, right. You know, his father taught him how to con and how to, you know, and really raised the kids, you know, with a criminal understanding. It was, it was quite, you know, twisted in that way. Um, you know, he was always running from the police. He was always, you know, doing shady business dealings that he would take the kids on. He would take them to like on road trips to Tijuana with stacks of cash. And, you know, which you kind of see a little bit of in the movie in the hotel room when he comes yeah. in with the cash into the safe. So, you know, his father, the father was involved in the criminal underworld. And then one day he did just up and disappear, but he apparently raised the kids saying, if I'm ever gone for more than 48 hours, clean out my stuff and get rid of everything. So when you think about that, like being raised like that, like that's not a normal thing right. for a parent yeah. to say to a child. And, um, you know, it, it's just, yeah, though there's so many fascinating things that like didn't make the cut. I will say that, you know, just it, it's such a, it was such a rich story to explore. I felt, you know, very lucky I got to make this movie because yeah, the characters were just so complex and interesting and that's, you know, that's what I'm after. But yes, no, the father did disappear and, you know, there's been rumors that Jason and the I, I did Jason specifically was like in touch with him after the father was funneling him money. There's all kinds of theories and who knows what's, you know, what actually happened and what didn't. Um, that's kind of what the film's about, you know, and wow, what's, what's, what's real and what's not. <laughs> it's not that easy to stay gone. You know, like, if, if, I if know, you, to, you know, if you and I keep in mind too, I had dozens of passports, driver's licenses, everything, you know, but at some point, you know, it catches up to you. That's why I was, it always kills me when you talk to the, you'll talk to these guys who have been like gone for 15 years and didn't ever have a, didn't have ID. Like how the yeah. hell did you go 15 years without ID? Yeah. You know, so the only guys I know that have really made it a long time went to like South America or something, somewhere like that and started their life over and basically lived just a regular kind of started a business and just lived a regular life. And, and even then, eventually I met, met him in jail. Yeah. So you're like, you were gone 25 years or 15 years. Where were you? Oh, I was in Brazil or I was in Colombia and I was doing this and that and just living a regular kind of life down there. And I was married and three kids. And then, you know, one day something happened and they arrested me. Somebody found out and somebody recognized me. Somebody told somebody and they grabbed me. And it was like, you know, wow, you didn't have idea. I was living as this guy. I had some drop, some information, not really, you know, didn't. Like I didn't really have ID. I had this, I had that. And they always typically were okay with that. And I never really got stopped and I avoided the law and, you know, they're not really able to run your stuff down there like they are here. So that I, I just, 
it's it's shocking to me you can get away for very long because you're there is so much interaction with law enforcement I mean, you're gonna get a ticket you know you think oh no no i'm gonna drive safely you're still gonna get a ticket bro yeah you know yeah. like at some yeah. point no it's crazy i can't even think of how someone would you know be able to a lot of people do think jason's dead i don't know you know it, it, that's possible i it's just yeah it's crazy i mean how could someone hide and stay well, hidden for that long you know? Well, okay. For my problem with that is, this guy has never really had a regular job. Like he's not going and getting a job at Walmart and you're working right. as a stock boy. Like even if he could get a driver's license, he's not going to get a regular job and never be. This is a guy who's had interaction with the law. He gets in trouble. He spends a lot of money. He borrows from people he can't pay back. He's running scam after scam and not well. So you know, so he's not going to. It, it's like the guys that escaped Alcatraz, right? Like they all drowned. You can sit here and say, you know, guys, oh, no, no, they all got to stop it. These were career criminals. The one thing I know is even if you take that guy and you pick him up and you put him in another state, you give him some, a little bit of money and you give him a new life. The truth is he's a criminal. He may go straight for a little bit, but he's going to start committing crimes again, because unless you're going to give him a job making a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. He's not going to be able to live off of $45,000 working as a stock clerk. And he's right. going to start cutting corners and he's going to get arrested because he's been arrested eight times. <laughs> right. So, you know, that same thing with Jason. Like I, I, so I'm really curious as to what's happened. One identifications a, a must. And two, how are you making a living? And, and look, if it's catching up to him in LA, this question catching up to you in the U S you can pick up and move across the country. Right. You know, but, you know, he also had obviously, which is odd, too, that he had a relationship with his family, which is probably part of his downfall. He tended to, I guess he kind of stayed in the same area and stayed connected to these people. And that allows these every time you run a scam, it's just going to keep catching up to you. Yeah. Yeah, that's so, no, crazy. I mean, also, you know, the world changed. Right. And, you know, he disappeared back and like it's hard to imagine someone being able to do it today. I don't know. You know, like just with the way technology's changed. You, you have more expertise in this than I do, but like- Well, just, I mean, you, so if you were gonna, willing to work a regular job, like if you really could do it, and you were able to get identification or ID issued to you, which is nearly impossible. Not, not that I couldn't do it or you couldn't do it. The problem is how do you do, how, you can't do it from scratch. You have to either steal someone's identity, which isn't hard, not hard to go and get a driver's license in in washington state or arizona in someone else's name but you can never have credit in their name because at some point this guy who lives in florida who you're using is you've got a duplicate a driver's license in the other state some point he pulls his credit and he goes the hell is there's a capital one i got a capital one credit card for forty five thousand dollars and i got another one for american bank of america for twenty thousand and an american express card what the, what's going on those aren't my credit cards he files, he starts looking in, addresses come up. Next thing you know, the police are knocking on your door. So that's an issue. So you would basically have to get identification. But now what I did was, you know, one, I made synthetic identities. Of course, they were fake people. I convinced Social Security to issue um, Social Security numbers to children that don't exist. And I was able to get IDs in their name and credit report, uh, credit, uh, credit profiles, credit cards, bank accounts. But I also interviewed, I would survey homeless people, get their information, order all their documents and get driver's licenses in their names, passports. I was able to travel and move around. So I had people but that weren't ever going to come across what I had done. The problem is what happens when I'm 60 and this guy dies? This homeless guy who lives under a bridge passes away. Now what do I do? At some point, Social Security cuts a check for a Social Security benefit. They notify the credit bureaus in a batch every 90 days. Hey, this person's deceased. And the next time I go to pull my credit or anyone pulls my credit, they say it says this person's deceased. That's an issue. Like right. these things will catch up to you eventually. So, yeah, it's it, it can be a problem. It could be real. what you could do. What I had into what I was on the brink of doing was basically just relocating to another country. You know, once you remove yourself from the system, even if that guy dies, they're not going to notify 
Australia that this person is deceased. You know, if you're living in somewhere else as a permanent resident alien, or maybe you go to St. Kitts and you get a British passport issued to you. Now you right. can pretty much go anywhere. Like, there's ways to do it if you have enough money, but most people just don't. And if you're running, you just don't. And it's, it's, it's an issue. So at some point it catches up to you. Uh, I would think, you know, I mean, in my case, it didn't really catch up to me as much as it just, you know, I was basically the media attention is what caught up to me. Right. You know, like, you know, there's datelines coming out, American greed comes out, like I'm taking off and I was pulling money out of the bank and somebody told somebody and that person just turned me in, you know, it's, um, but yeah, it's, uh, if you're, a a moderate kind of a non flashy guy that they're not really tracking. You might be able to do it. Oh, it'd be hard. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be hard. Don't try it. Oh, Just I won't. Stick with what you're doing. <laughs> I'll tell you though. I should, I should have had you consult on the movie, uh, but next one. Um, yeah. yeah. Good times. You know, another thing that always kills me is uh, everybody always, they're always like, I always get asked, um, um, you know, what was it like on the run? God, it must have been horrible, like stressful and this and that. And the, the truth is, I, I had a great time on the run. Like, it was one of the best parts of my entire life. Like, you know, it, was, it wasn't it was stressful. It wasn't horrible. Like, I'm getting pulled over. I'm getting traffic tickets. Uh, you, you pull me over. I'm going 90 miles an hour, 80 miles an hour. The cop pulls me over. I pull over. It's not my driver's license. I'm like, yeah, here. Yeah. They're like, how fast were you going? I'm like, it depends. I got it up to 90. How long have you been behind me? And they're like, yeah, I, was, I got you at 80. I'm like, well, it was 80 then. And you know, they run it, write a ticket. Listen, I got so many traffic tickets as somebody one time. I had to go to traffic school as the guy. I was going to lose his license. So, you know, I'm, so it wasn't, I wasn't concerned. I wasn't worried about interaction with the police because I have a real passport. I have a real driver's license. I have my car. It's, you know, my car is got full coverage insurance on it. You know, I'm driving as that person. I'm not stupid enough to drive around in a stolen vehicle with a broken tail light and a dead body in the trunk. You know what I'm saying? Like it's, everything checks out. So I was never concerned really being on the run, but if you didn't have that skill set, it would, it probably would be horrible. Yeah. I can't imagine. <laughs> so anyway, something to think about, um, for your next movie, you know, exactly. Right, look into it. Uh, <laughs> so what, so what, what, what is your next project? What do you, I have a few going on. I, um, you know, it's funny because in the years getting American Murderer made, it was all about that. You know, first feature is so consuming and, you know, such an endeavor. And now that it's done, it's kind of now about balancing multiple. Um, you know, I've been getting sent scripts to direct, uh, which has been really cool and uh, getting to read stuff. And uh, I, I recently attached to one that's hoping to go out uh, later this year. We'll see with all the, you know, we have a strike going on here in Hollywood that I'm behind and, um, all that, but I'm attached to, yeah, I'm attached to two different scripts and then I, uh, I'm writing my own, um, have a lot of scripts in the crime thriller and Western genres. Um, you know, my hope is to eventually be able to do a lot of different kinds of movies, but I, I do love the crime genre. I have a feeling I'll be, you know, comfortable there. Cause you know, I think there's a great opportunity to make great character driven crime films that really don't cost a ton to get made and you know are about the characters and the people you know i think we need more movies about people not that i i love all kinds of films you know i i, I love comic movies i love action movies i love sci-fi i love everything but you know i think we're we're a little you know there's a bit of a drought in the film space on good character driven stories so that that's what i'm you know pushing out there and trying to you know trying to do what i can to get them made Listen, you got to go to my website. I mean, I've got probably 13 or 14 um, synopses of uh, different stories I wrote about guys in prison. I've, I've written probably close to 20, but I think there's 30. I don't know. Wait, there might be. I think there's 17, but some of them have been optioned. But there's probably, I think there's about 13 or 14 that are, are available. And, and some of them, you know, are... Uh, you know, great. They're great movies. They're, I mean, not great movies, sorry. Great synopses. I always call, call them synopses. They're basically articles, you know, yeah. of these stories from these guys that, you know, that some of them are still locked up. Um, but yeah, they're, they're really interesting. And, and one of the things about it is because I was in prison, 
And I wasn't able to, like, I've got the subject, but I don't have, like, I, I don't have, I have some articles in the subject. That's all I've got. So I always ordered the Freedom of Information Act, right? So I would get their sentencing transcript, their indictment, all the FBI interviews or Secret Service or DEA, whoever they were investigated by. And, you know, sometimes I would, you know, I'd write letters to get uh, uh, additional information. And then I'd be able to put the whole thing together. So they're always super accurate. Um, and I, I typically have a 360 degree view of the whole thing. Cause a lot of these guys don't know what's, what's happening on the other side. They're like, this happened. And I'm like, well, why that happen? And they're like, I don't know. I mean, they just showed up. I'm like, well, you don't know why. Well, no, I mean, I pled guilty. Nobody told me why they, sh they showed up. So then of course I ordered the documents. I come back and I'm like, okay, do you know a guy named Pookie? They're like, what? I'm like, yeah, he robbed the place. And then I start, and they're like, oh my God, that's how they got that. Yes, yes. And, you know, break it down. So a lot of the stories are, uh, you know, uh, they're, they're, yeah, they're, they're super, they're super interesting. A lot of them have, not a lot of them, well, probably 70% of those stories haven't been covered. There might be an article, but we're talking about a small 500 word article, maybe another one about sentencing, and that's it. So yeah, yeah. they, but these are stories that you would hear, I would hear in prison and I would sit there and go like, this is like, this is like the movie Heat. Right. You know, this, or this is like, like, how is this? Not, this is the wolf. This is better than the Wolf of Wall Street. Right. Like, this is insanity. And, and yet, you know, of course it, it just never happened because the guy got 17 years and the other guy got 12 and this guy, these guys are still in prison. And then of course, when they get out, they don't want to talk about it. They just want to try and reacclimate themselves back into society and just forget about it. They still have to live their life. So nobody's out there turning it into anything. Yeah. So anyway, and like I said, my story's on there. You should go there. You know, if you do uh -huh. go, it's matter of fact, you don't even have to read it. I have an, a, I have an audible version of the synopsis. Awesome. Takes now, I, I know what I'm doing tonight. So I'll be, I'll be looking at those. I'm telling, I mean, um, yeah, yeah. You got to check it out. Yeah. The, the website, like there's like a little summary and you, it allows you to either read the whole, the full length article, or you can listen to the, to the, um, to the narrated version. So, yeah. And my story is there. It's called shark in the housing pool. It's got a big shark on the cover. It's not a great <laughs> cover, but whatever. It's fine. Uh, Love it. Yeah. Interesting. I actually had two more that I was going to put up. But like I said, um, one was picked up by Rolling Stone. The other one, I'm um, actually, I'm, I, I just had it edited because I, I, I'm, I'm a horrible speller. Like I could, I always get something. Even I could read the same sentence four times and I'm, I'll still miss something. Uh, so I, I, I typically send it off to be edited uh, from a guy in prison. And he'll send it, he'll send it to, you know, three guys in prison. They'll all read it and come back and I'll have, you know, 30 corrections and I'll make them. And then I may or may not put that up because I'm supposed to be working with a production company and sometimes they don't want you to put it up. So I, I might just put it up. I might just put it up and then, cause I haven't signed anything yet. That's what I might do. So anyway, yeah, you gotta, you have to look into it. I will do. And, um, all right. Well, what, what, uh, you got some other, some other stuff, but you're not talking about it. You know, anything specific? You're not, no, I'm yeah, not I, I have a couple, you know, yeah. Like I said, I have a few different ones. Um, you know, books, I've optioned articles. So yeah, it's just kind of a game of, we'll see, I'm going to see which one goes first. Um, you know, at this point though, yeah, it's all quite in the formative stages. So it's best not to say it, just not to jinx it. Um, Publicly on a, you know, oh listen, I, I podcast mean, episode, but no, I, I have a couple I could talk about. I have a one script I've written about a socialite um, who pulled off a car bombing in 1996 with a hitman. Um, that's a crazy one. I've had and that this book is true out. crime. Mm -hmm. Yep, that one's a true crime and happened in '96. When Pam Phillips had her husband, ex-husband, blown up. Uh, wild story with a lot of twists and turns kind of a bit of like a theme i've it's been called a female american murderer <laughs> to a lot of people um i have one about a kidnapping in texas that took place in the 80s um you know a lot of like in that realm so i'm sure i'm going to go down your 
website's rabbit hole and be like, yeah, I'm gonna, you know, but yeah, I, I try to write a lot. I treat, you know, I treat writing like, a, you know, to me, it's like a daily ritual. You know, I wake up in the morning early and I, I, I start writing pages because that's how I like to get my brain going and, you know, the creative flow. So, you know, and I'm, I know you're a writer as well. And it's, you know, I find it's like a muscle, you know, and like I treat it kind of like going to the gym, you know, you just have to do it. Even if you don't want to, you just got to go. And yeah, yeah, I was, I was gonna say I was on a pretty good, had a pretty good routine going until about probably two weeks ago. Like I was wait probably for several months. I had, you know, you, I, it, sometimes it just, it breaks down. Like you wake up, at, yeah. I wake up at like three or four in the morning, come downstairs, work, uh, you know, basically writing up notes for, you know, into a paragraph or, or two and, you know, slowly put together, you know, take an outline basically to slowly start putting together the story. And I was doing great for, I'm telling you, m several months. And then a couple of months ago, so I forget exactly what threw me off and I've, I've been slipping. I'm going to sleep until five, you know, cause you know, you I got really well, good routine. You're, five's still good. I, I, I'm, I'm up at six and that's hard for me. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, but, I, but we go, I go to the gym at six. So I mean, it's like, I'm up at five, but by six you're leaving, you can't get anything done in an hour. I need two or three hours to kind of, you know, get my read through everything, get situated and say, okay, this is there. What this, this seemed interesting. This seemed crucial before. Now it's not, this seemed crucial. Now it's not, this is, you know, and you start, you know how it is like you do a ton of research and you throw out 85 percent of it and you're like because you know it's about like well, how much can I fit into an hour oh yeah and you know first first drafts always suck you know you yeah. just have to get through it and do the next one the next one and you know the joy they say the joy of rewriting come the joy of writing comes in rewriting i think that's true you know because the first oh, yeah. draft's hard and painful you just gonna you know it's gonna be bad but then you just redo it and you know well, uh, I, I think I had somebody, t well, this was a literary agent one time tell me, he was like, like the hardest thing in the world is to stare at that blank page, you know, but once you've got the stuff written down, going back and rewrite it, like that's where yeah. the talent is. Like that's easier. It's more enjoyable. It's when you're just staring, like, you know, even, you know how it is, even starting that the first sentence. Like, yeah. But then you, sometimes you start the first and then it just goes and goes and goes and goes. You rewrite. It's great. But. Yeah, it's um, but I do love it. I do love Me writing. Me too. Yeah, yeah. Um, listen, man, I could talk forever. I don't know if you noticed that I'm a talker. You're a talker. I am too. too. You are, We're talkers. But, <laughs> We're um, talkers. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you for having me on, Matt. This was a lot of fun, and uh, you know, I look for looking forward to reading some of your books. And uh, you know, I know you call yourself a all kinds of things, but you know, I think you're an example of someone who turned your stuff around. You know, you nah, became a writer. Not over. <laughs> I can still go bad. Don't. No, don't. I... <laughs> the um, director of American Murderer warns you, don't. <laughs> no, things no. are things are just, I always say that you know, things are just too good out here. Like, honestly, like, you know, I don't know that you need to go to prison for 10 or 15 years, but you go to prison for six months or a year and you come out and you're like, God, what is everybody complaining about? <laughs> it's amazing out here life is yeah. so good even when it's bad it's still pretty good yeah. so um yeah it definitely puts things in perspective for you or for me anyway you probably have your head on 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 straight anyway hey you guys i appreciate you watching thank you very much i hope you like the interview do me a favor if you like the video share it subscribe hit the bell so you get notified um also leave me a comment in the comment section I'm going to leave the the link to uh, to the American Murder website or a link to where you can rent it on YouTube. I'll figure that out. Uh, I'll talk to Matt and we'll figure out what we need to put in the link and any of his social media. Uh, we'll also put in the description. We'll put some links there. So once again, I really appreciate you guys watching and thank you very much and check out some of the other videos. See you.